When you think about the Constitution, other than thinking of it as a physical thing you might pull out of your hip pocket and brandish at someone during an argument, when you think of the Constitution, what do you think of? You think of the big stuff, right? You think of the separation of powers. You think of uh, the basics of who we are as a country. Divided government, checks and balances, no king, the Bill of Rights. But the Constitution also prescribes some really, really specific nuts and bolts things, too. Uh, the census, for example, the reason we get counted every 10 years is because the Constitution says we have to. Uh, the idea of the president delivering periodic State of the Union addresses, that's in the Constitution. The post office. There is such a thing as the United States Postal Service because of the Constitution, because the Constitution specifically gives Congress the power to create the post office. The Founding Fathers wanted us to have a postal service, which is why the news today from the Postal Service seems so particularly disastrous. At Congress's insistence, the Postal Service is trying to cut costs by $20 billion. And part of the plan to do that now involves lowering the post office's delivery standards for the first time in 40 years. The plan involves closing down about half the Postal Service's mail processing centers and slowing down first-class mail delivery, making the post office, which functions very well, thank you very much, and purposely making it run worse. So if you were getting your Netflix movies nice and quick, if in fact that quick delivery was crucial to the success of businesses like Netflix and many others, well, too bad. Thanks to Congress, the post office is about to slow that whole enterprise down. This very specific, super useful American thing that is specifically provided for in the Constitution is now poised to drop its own standards unless there is a we the people outcry over them being forced into this new plan. One of the other really specific things provided for in the Constitution is the presidential pardon. After you've exhausted all of the rights you're guaranteed in the criminal justice system, there's one very specific right that's given to the president and the president alone. It's the right to issue a pardon. And something seems to have gone terribly awry with that power now. That's next in a primetime exclusive. Stay with us. Okay, remember Gerald Ford pardoning Richard Nixon? Gerald Ford using his power as president to let the previous president off the hook for Watergate. Remember Poppy Bush pardoning all the Reagan administration officials who were going to go to the pokey for Iran-Contra? Tonight, a new presidential pardon scandal that ranks right up there. That's next. Stay tuned. Article 2, Section 2 of the Constitution, the president is given the power to pardon people. For a country that took great pains to be really unkinglike, the pardon power is sort of kinglike. It's basically an absolute power given to the president alone. It has been used thousands of times by presidents, and most of the time, pardons aren't that big a deal. That said, sometimes they are scandalous, like Gerald Ford's pardon of Richard Nixon in 1974, or like the Iran-Contra pardons when President George H.W. Bush pardoned Reagan administration officials, including former Defense Secretary Caspar Weinberger, who was about to go on trial for his role in allegedly illegally selling arms to the Iranians and then using the money to fund rebel groups in Nicaragua, which Congress explicitly said it would be illegal to fund. So sometimes pardons are scandalous. Sometimes pardons are a nice mix of pitiful and disgusting. Like when on his last day in office, President Clinton pardoned a man named Mark Rich. He was a fugitive charged with tax fraud and with running illegal oil deals with Iran. His ex-wife was a big Democratic fundraiser and lobbied heavily for the Mark Rich pardon. And she gave lots of money to the Clinton library. So sometimes pardons make scandals. But most of the time, we hear very little about them. And we hear nothing about it when somebody is denied a pardon. That is one reason why ProPublica's blockbuster new investigation into the pardon process is so groundbreaking. Through a Freedom of Information Act request and a lot of shoe leather reporting thereafter, uh, ProPublica gained access to nearly 2,000 pardon requests under President George W. Bush. They then analyzed a random sample of 500 or so of those cases. And with rigorous statistical analysis, controlling for all other factors, check out what they found. Look at this. Quote, white criminals seeking presidential pardons over the past decade have been nearly four times as likely to succeed as minorities. White people are 400 percent more likely to get a presidential pardon than African-Americans and other minorities, even when you control for the type of crime, the sentence, etc. 
After the Clinton Mark Rich scandal, President George W. Bush decided he would not handle pardon requests directly through the White House. They'd all be delegated to a little office at the Justice Department called the Office of the Pardon Attorney. That office would make recommendations, and President Bush would then have the choice whether or not to follow those recommendations. When the White House looks at a pardon recommendation from that little Justice Department office, the president is not told the race of the person who wants the pardon. And of course, the Office of the Pardon Attorney says that race plays no role whatsoever in whether they recommend someone should get a pardon or shouldn't get one. But somehow, it is the outcome of this squirrely little process that you are four times as likely to be pardoned simply by virtue of you being a white person. Quote, every drug offender forgiven during the Bush administration at the pardon attorney's recommendation, 34 of them, every single one, was a white person. And although race is the most striking factor here, the ProPublica investigation also found other weird things that affect your likelihood of getting a pardon, like, say, whether you've been divorced, whether you're in debt, and, of course, whether you have a friend in Congress. Pardon applicants who had a member of Congress make inquiries on their behalf were three times as likely to be pardoned as a person who didn't have a friend on the Hill doing that for them. The president's power to pardon is an extraordinary power. In a country like ours, it is extraordinary for a president to have a power like that. It is an extraordinary power given to the elected official from whom we expect the most and the most extraordinary responsibility. Fobbing that responsibility off to a secretive backwater office neither absolves the president for that responsibility, nor does it seem to be a way to produce particularly sane outcomes. Joining us now is ProPublica senior reporter Daphna Linzer. She wrote this piece about presidential pardons along with her colleague Jennifer LaFleur. Uh, Daphna, congratulations on this scoop. I know you have been working on this for a long time. Yeah, thank you very much. Let me ask you first um, if I got any of that wrong. Was that a, I know that was, that was only touching on what you found, but was that a fair <laughs> summary? Yeah, it was exactly right. And I, and I think you're right that you know forgiveness is really what a pardon is about. And it just is only going to one segment of society. Only, only white applicants are receiving this presidential forgiveness. Others are not getting it. It made me think of that Saturday Night Live skit where um, the black actor woke up in the morning as a white person <laughs> and went down to the newsstand and got the paper for free. <laughs> Wait a minute. This is how it works, right? There's this, it's, it, is, it is a documentation of really, really specific white privilege, that if you are white, you will be allowed all sorts of things uh, in your pardon application that, that minority applicants never got away, never got away with. Um, how does the Office of the Pardon Attorney, and indeed the justice structure around the pardoning process, explain this racial disparity? You know, they haven't. They haven't explained it to us at all, and we went to them months before we published the story to tell them sort of what our findings were looking like, and to say to them, look, you know, here we are, we've got this gigantic race disparity right at the heart of the president's only unfettered power. You're the only place in the world that touches up against this power, and all of your recommendations really, I mean, you're just really recommending white applicants for pardon. And uh, and they, they have no explanation for it. Um, you know, they didn't challenge the statistics at all. Um, they said it all looked good to them. Um, and then they said, well, you know, you just looked at objective measures, but there's subjective things that we look at too, which was kind of surprising because those subjective things are seem to be, um, you know, even more extraordinary when we looked at them uh, side by side, as you said, with applicants, white and black applicants who are almost identical right down to, to the race. And in each case, the white applicant will get the pardon and um, the minority applicant, almost always the African-American applicant, does not get the pardon. They clearly say that they do not intend for there to be a racial disparity in the outcomes here, but they're very open, at least they're open with you in your reporting about the idea that something like debt or divorce would be a reason for recommending a pardon or not recommending a pardon. What, what is the justification for that? You know, they're looking for the perfect person. They're looking for this incredibly stable person, this ideal person uh, who will not present a risk to the president, who will not uh, be some person who goes out and commits a crime again. Uh, that's, that's their sense of what they're looking for. But again, as you said, you know, in each of these cases, you know, we looked at bankruptcies, we looked at liens, tax liens against people, you know, did they own their own home, all kinds of things. And in each case, we found um, minorities who were um, struck out, you know, who had bankruptcies or other issues. I mean, we found, you know, African-American applicants who wanted a pardon in order to improve their employment stability and were denied for employment instability or um, seeking a pardon because they want 
um, you know, they want a better job. They want financial stability and are denied for financial instability. Um, and at the same time, we found um, successful white applicants who, who were pardoned by President Bush, who had bankruptcies, who filed for bankruptcy more than once, um, who were divorced multiple times, um, who had, uh, you know, for me, one of the striking things was uh, language that was used to describe um, African Americans who had children outside of a marriage, where those children were described in denial recommendations as illegitimate or born out of wedlock. Uh, white successful applicants who had children outside of a marriage, those children were described as having been born from a previous or non-marital relationship. Completely different language. Wow. One of the um, the factors that you found was statistically significant in whether or not a person got a pardon was whether or not a member of Congress intervened mm -hmm. on their behalf. Was there also a correlation between the person seeking the pardon or their family giving money to that member of Congress? Are people, in effect, trying to buy pardons? Um, we saw a couple things. One is, as you said, if you've got a member of Congress in your corner, you are three times more likely to get a pardon. Um, in some cases, uh, you know, there are, there are people who are seeking pardons who are actively donating to that member of Congress. Uh, we saw instances where uh, there was a donation, you know, made on a Tuesday. There was a letter written to the White House on behalf of the applicant three days later. Uh, you know, the, the, the applicant gets a pardon a few weeks later. A new donation comes in from the family ten days later. Uh, you know, that happened. We didn't see a single member of Congress in one letter to the pardon office disclose voluntarily if they were writing on behalf of a donor. Um, you know, so we saw, you know, we saw a, a bunch of different things. One of the things that really surprised me was the number of members of Congress who have close personal friends who are convicted felons. And who are willing to test to put that <laughs> yeah. in writing yes. on their behalf. Well, would that be a potentially effective reform to the process? I mean, on the one hand, this is a, this is a power that, is not, that doesn't come with a lot of due process protections. It's essentially supposed to be the president's mercy mm -hmm. power. It's a, it's a safety valve. It's a case, and therefore, miscarriages of justice. It's not the way that it's used anymore, but there aren't any due process protections. So I guess while it is horrifying, I don't even know on what grounds we complain that this is being done so unfairly other than just a sense that it's unfair. But I wonder if there could be reforms to the process that would make it less blatantly unfair. Could, would, would disclosing donations to the member of Congress making the appeal on a person's behalf help? Yeah, maybe. I mean, one of the things too, and in, in including in you know in, in the in the issue of donations or in members of Congress, you know, sometimes members of Congress, you know, were doing just a regular, you know, nice constituent service. They were writing on behalf of a constituent who they didn't know. Um, but if you have a member of Congress who's your representative who's not interested in writing a letter on your behalf, you know, then your chances just fell the yeah. likelihood of getting a pardon. And the guy in the next district over who has a representative who is interested in writing a pardon has a better chance. Um, you know, the one thing about reform on the issue of pardons is that, you know, this is completely at the president's discretion. He actually doesn't need Congress to reform this. Uh, this pardon office was put together, you know, at the very beginning of this country. Um, Grover Cleveland, when he was president, signed an executive order just making, you know, all the paperwork go through a pardon clerk. Um, but that pardon office, that's not what's in the Constitution. Uh, you know, that could change. I mean, there's lots of things that they could look at reform-wise. Um, you know, you could broaden the people uh, who are looking and sifting through pardon applications. You could take it out of the Justice Department with something that, uh, you know, early, early advisors to President Obama were looking at, taking it away from career prosecutors who made their names uh, prosecuting, uh, uh, you know, drug, you know, drug offenses in this country. You could do that. You, know, you could make it much more similar to what they do at state levels in some, in some places where you have more of a parole or pardon board, uh, where, in fact, you could even come before the board. Um, and argue your case, mm -hmm. uh, where there be a lot more transparency in something like that. The pro those proposals for reform early in the Obama administration, one of the most interesting things uh, in your reporting, we've posted a link to the whole series at our website tonight, but congratulations on this, Daphna. Thank you. I think this is the sort of reporting that is actually going to change the way that things are done. Congratulations. Thank you. Thanks. All right. Um, Daphna Linzer is a senior reporter for ProPublica, and at mattoblog.com, uh, you'll find links tonight to that whole series, a year's worth of reporting on this pardon process. All right.